Welcome back to the channel. <clears throat> Today we're going to dis be discussing the design of a method to dry your compressor air. <clears throat> there are some very uh, misleading things going on in compressed air system DIY pre-coolers and serpentine condensation coils. From an engineering standpoint, they generally have the right idea, but implement them in a very inefficient and sometimes counterproductive manner. In this video, I will describe the design of a DIY highly efficient and inexpensive compressed air drying system that can outperform refrigeration dryers at considerably less capital and recurring costs. You will be able to easily construct such a system in your garage, lower the cost of your dry compressed air, and make you more competitive. I am going to have to briefly discuss the underlying engineering principles behind the design. This background will also inform you why most DIY approaches you see on YouTube don't work very well. First we need to start off with some definitions. The CAT is the compressed air temperature. The OAT is the outside air temperature or your shop temperature. The PDPT is the pressure dew point temperature. And the T temperature gradient is uh, equal to the PDPT minus the CAT. <clears throat> we'll be using a condensation as opposed to an absorption slash adsorption or osmosis methodology. <clears throat> condensation can only occur when the CAT falls below the PDPT. The air is super saturated at this point and cannot hold moisture in solution. If this supersaturated air comes in contact with a surface or particle, the water will come out of solution and condensate on that surface. <clears throat> so let's look at uh, an equation that basically tells you how this works. So if the cat is less than the PDPT, then condensation occurs. The, the greater the temperature gradient between cat and PDPT, the faster the condensation will occur. Once condensation starts to occur, the water that comes out of solution must coalesce onto a surface. The longer the air comes into contact with a surface, the more water will be condensed. I will refer to this as the dwell. So the condensation rate is a function of the temperature gradient and dwell. We want to optimize both of these factors. The following is a simple logic equation for this relationship. So the temperature gradients times the dwell results in a condensation drying rate. The PDP temp is very different from the atmospheric dew point temp. The higher the air pressure, the higher the PDP temp which results in a faster condensation slash drying rate. This will allow us to condense water even on hot days. The important takeaway <clears throat> is that at any place in your compressed air system where the cat is less than the PDPT, condensation will occur. It will condense on the walls of the system and that water must be drained off into a water trap. The trick is to make this process as efficient as possible, thus resulting in very dry air. We must also understand adiabatic cooling and heating and how we reuse these processes to optimally condensate water out of our compressed air. Adiabatic heating and cooling is the basis for all closed loop refrigeration systems. Compression causes the compressed air temperature to rise due to adiabatic heating. Typical compressor exhaust temperatures are in the 250 to 300 degree Fahrenheit range. This exhaust temperature range is a function of altitude, ambient air temperature, and the amount and rate of compression. This energy is wasted, or excuse me, this heating is wasted energy unless you plan to use it to heat your shop in the winter. Our goal is to reduce this high cat back to room temperature in the shortest amount of time possible, thereby increasing the temperature gradient 
which increases the condensation slash drying rate. When we use a pressure regulator to lower the tank pressure down to line pressure, a process called adiabatic cooling occurs. The expansion of the air causes the air to cool. In our case, we can expect about a 30 degree Fahrenheit drop in the compressed air temperature. This drop in temperature further increases the temperature gradient and accelerates the condensation rate. We will have to be mindful not to let the cat drop below freezing. We'll now look at a design that applies the pressure dew point temperature, the temperature gradient, and the adiabatic cooling slash heating principles in such a way that efficiently dries our compressed air. The design consists of three segments. The first segment consists of a compressor, a radiator, condensation coil, coil and a water trap. <clears throat> segment two consists of the air tank, which maintains the tank pressure in a set range, and a discharge regulator. These are standard items on a compressor system. And segment three consists of another condensation coil and water trap. The tank discharge regulator in this condensation coil must be enclosed in a thermally insulated box to attain and maintain a max temperature gradient. So let's look at a schematic of such a system. We will evaluate our system for the following weather conditions. 79 degrees Fahrenheit, relative humidity 55.9, and a dew point of 68 degrees Fahrenheit. This is kind of a typical Florida day. Our design parameters for the system are as follows. We're going to have a 30 gallon tank, compressor output tip range, temps range from 250 to 300 degree Fahrenheit. We will regulate segment two, which is the tank pressure between 155 and 110 PSI for an average pressure of 132.5 PSI. This results in the following maximum temperature gradients for each segment. These gradients will only occur if the cat is cooled to the outside air temperature. Okay, the segment one design. Now, the first thing that we must accomplish in segment one is to reduce the cat to below the pressure dew point temperature. We will use an air-cooled radiator to accomplish this. Once the PDPT has been reached, condensation will start to occur. The greater the temperature gradient, the faster the condensation rate. Our goal is to lower the cat to OAT plus 5 degrees Fahrenheit. You want to size your radiator so that the cat at the radiator output is OAT plus 5 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. At this point, you will have achieved your best T grad, temperature gradient, which will yield the highest condensa condensation rate. The sole goal of the radio radiator is to reduce the cat to OAT plus 5 degrees Fahrenheit, not to condense water, although some condensation will occur in the radiator. We now need to transition to a simple metal condensation coil to extract as much water as possible. In fact, this is where almost all the condensation and drying of the air is going to occur in this second condensation coil. We should be adjusting the length of the condensation coil to achieve a relative humidity less than 5% at the exit of the condensation coil. This may be a bit of trial and error, but more is always better. You can add additional radiators and increase the length of the condensation coil to match the size of your system. We want to maximize the cooling capacity of the radiator. We will use a pressurized plenum to force air through the entire surface of the radiator at a uniform speed. The plenum will be pressurized with a ducted fan. A pressurized plenum will transfer twice as much heat as a surface mounted fan. A water trap will be placed at the end of the condensation coil. You must make sure you orient your radiator and condensation coil in such a manner that you do not have any loops that will not drain by gravity. We should now talk about the amount of energy and cost incurred to compress gas. On average, only 12.5% of the compressor motor horsepower is used to compress the gas. The rest is radiated as heat energy. So a 1.6 horsepower compressor motor 
for a 1.6 horsepower compressor motor, approximately 1.4 horsepower is acting as a room heater. That is 143 watts per hour or 3,563 BTUs per hour of wasted energy. That is equivalent to a one and a half ton air conditioning unit. This is great in the winter, but very detrimental on hot afternoon summer days. Venting the air exiting the radiator to outside to the outside would be a help during the summer and save you a lot of money and discomfort. We should also talk about what often happens if you do not use a pre-cooler. The distance between the tank fill line and the exhaust line are often within five to six inches of each other. If you put a demand on the line service and the compressor turns on, you are often effectively dumping very hot, i.e. 250 to 300 degree Fahrenheit air, directly into your service line. No condensation coil will be occur no condensation will be occurring when this happens. If you happen to be running an after tank condensation coil, its efficiency will be reduced significantly when this happens. Segment 2 design. Uh, it consists of your standard compressor tank system. Segment 1. Segment 1 air is dumped into the tank where it cycles between 110 and 150 psi. If any moisture manages to enter the tank, it will slowly condensate on the tank walls if the tank temperature is below the pressure dew point temperature. If you have designed segment one well, then very little water should be condensating in your tank. Section three design. The tank has a discharge pressure regulator set to 100 PSI. The compressed air temperature should be less than or equal to OAT by plus 5F by the time it gets to segment three. The air is then ported into a post-tank condensation coil as depicted. If the compressed air temperature is below the pressure dew point temperature, then it will continue to condensate water in the condensation coil. However, when we regulate the air down to 100 psi, the expansion of the air cools the air due to adiabatic cooling. This increases the max T grad and improves drying efficiency. This problem, this can be a problem in the winter as freezing in the condensation coil is possible. Again, the condensation rate is a function of the temperature gradient in the dwell in the coil. This condensation coil is best implemented in using a 3 8 inch rubber hose because it does not conduct heat very well and can easily be formed into a circular coil. The regulator and condensation coil should be thermally insulated. The adiabatic cooling occurs at the step-down regulator, so you want it and the coil to be insulated from the room air, so the coil is not heated by the room air. You want the coil to stay as cool and as, as long as possible, i.e. maximize the temperature diff for as long as possible. Extend the length of the condensation coil i.e. dwell, as required to get your desired results. Dwell is critical to performance. Place a water trap at the exit of this condensation coil. During the winter, you may have to remove the insulation from the coil to keep the water from freezing. It is difficult to predict exactly what the relative humidity of the compressed gas will actually be with this system, as it will vary as the ambient temp and relative humidity vary. That's the same problem with refrigeration systems. However, for a passive system, this design is very efficient and has a large thermal drying range. It is much cheaper to build and less costly to operate when compared to a closed loop refrigeration dryer and yields the same quality of air, if not better. You should always use a small desiccant dryer in front of your critical tools, such as a paint sprayer or plasma cutter as a last line of defense. Part two to this video will cover the fabrication of this system and some pitfalls to avoid. Disclaimer, this video is for educational purposes only and should not be construed as professional engineering advice. Pressurized systems are inherently dangerous if not constructed properly. Seek professional help if you do not know what you are doing. Thanks for watching.